It's 2021, y'all, and I'm excited to kick off a new season of Scratch That. Sarah Thomas is NFL's first full-time female official. She was named one of Sports Illustrated's 200 most influential figures of all time. Sarah is a force to be reckoned with. She was the first female to officiate a major college football game, the first to officiate a bowl game, and the first to officiate in a Big Ten stadium. And she made postseason history during the Patriots Chargers 2019 AFC Divisional Championship by being, again, the first woman to officiate a playoff game. Her story of breaking the glass ceiling time after time was so inspiring that we invited her to share it with our members during last year's annual meeting. I chatted with Sarah right before the football season began this year to talk about her journey, how she's learned to adapt to the changes that COVID-19 has required, and how she's finding balance between working and raising her children. What I learned is that she's not only an inspiration, she's a pretty awesome gal and a good Southerner to boot. Get inspired and listen up. Sarah, let's talk a little bit about how you started with officiating. What got you going? Being kicked out of a men's basketball league, well, to be honest. Do it. <laughs> yeah. No, I had played sports my whole life. College basketball came to an end, and I went and played in a men's league with my brothers. And after three years, I was kicked out because I was a girl. And I just kind of was like, what am I going to do with myself? My older brother was officiating, and... I said, hey, can, can girls do that? And he said, I guess so, sis, be there at six. That's what really got me started. But going into that first meeting and seeing these guys challenge each other, and I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. A lot of people probably still don't think I know what I'm doing. But yeah. um, I just I fell in love with it and saw a way to give back and stay involved in organized sports. Yeah, it's interesting. I mentioned to you that my husband uh, was officiating through college and then did high school ball. And they, the referees are as competitive. The officials are as competitive as the players are. It's a yeah. very, it's a competitive sport to get where you are. And it I think is. people sort of underestimate that to some degree. I but what led you of... to try football instead of basketball if basketball was your passion? Yeah, so I did do basketball. You did uh, It's okay. funny. Yeah, I was just having this discussion last night with a group of friends and Whenever I started in football, the assigning secretary, Harold Cooper, he said, don't you want to try basketball? And so I think that was his nice cordial way of, <laughs> hey, we see more women in basketball, but he never said that. But I tried basketball and pa basketball was a passion of mine, but I found myself wanting to coach the girls mm -hmm. when I was officiating instead of officiating. And then I would get you know, kind of irritated sometimes, like, all right, these girls have got a lot of talent. Come on, coaches. So I just found myself leaning towards that as opposed to officiating. And it wasn't as much of a challenge to me because I felt like I knew the game of basketball in a sense from a player standpoint. But with football, I didn't know the game. So it was a huge learning curve for not only the rules, but also the game itself. I mean, as fans, we think we know but really and truly I was going to say a good, a good Southern girl didn't know football. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I find I, that I hard mean, to believe. <laughs> you think, I think I did, you know I mean? Like yeah, I know what a yeah. touchdown is. Oh, that's holding, but really is it holding? Mm -hmm. Just, yes. We love watching football, especially here in Mississippi in the South, like right. you said, but yeah, I just found myself being more challenged in the game of football. Yeah. So you got going at a high school level, right? Right. And, and how, how was that? Did the, did those high school boys take to you or was there, were there some giggles and laughs? There was more of a shock factor. Like, yeah, th that, that's a girl. Um, and I wore my hair in a ponytail during high school. And then when I got to college, it was a little different. So I tucked my hair. So from the presence from high school, having my ponytail out, the guys saw me coming from a mile away and they, you know, she's, that's a girl, but college, it was just, oh, that's a woman. And because uh, I tucked my hair. So mm -hmm. I think it was more of a shock factor than anything. Now, I don't think necessarily laughs or giggles because when you're an athlete, you really don't care male, female, black, white. You just want it to be called right. Right, right. And so as you went into college, you said you tucked your hair. Was it a, was that a, a intentional choice to sort of like neutralize yourself or was it most convenient the hair is a situation when you're running on the field I can understand that no I, I prefer to have it in a ponytail but Gerald Austin conference USA supervisor knew 
that I would be stereotyped as she's a woman, why is she out here? If they saw my ponytail, he's been there. He's been at the level of college. He's been there with NFL. And it was more in my best interest in his opinion for me to do that. And I do agree with him. I did, I blended in. It wasn't necessarily, oh, she was blown a call as a woman. But now there are a lot of more women that are officiating and I'm gonna entertain wearing my hair out this year. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I guess I could understand, you know, it's a, both a path of least resistance, but also neutrality ensures that you're judged on the merit of of what you do. Exactly. And I, I can, I can appreciate and understand that. I can't tuck my hair and fix it over here, but for most part, I'm welcomed (laughs) as well. Talk to me a little bit about as you were breaking into the NFL, how you feel like that reception was, How, how did people receive that move? I think the players, coaches, my peers, honestly, they, they accepted it. But of course, like any new rookie, any new employee, I try not to just put it towards a male-female thing. But yes, there was a level of respect that I had to earn, but that's in any occupation. Yeah. And when they saw my merit or they saw that I'm working as hard as you are off the field to be ready when we go on the field, are we going to make mistakes as officials? Of course, but it's all about and how you prepare to get to that, that game. Just like before you get to the boardroom, you've got to be able to do the things behind the desk in your own office. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of like that in the game of football. Who do you feel most mentored you through that? Who, who helped you know what you had to do to prepare? Who took you through those steps to get you ready? I can't just like name one. So many there's people. So, there's yeah. so many. And yes, Gerald Austin, Wayne Winkler, Jeff Bergman, Byron Boston. I mean, there's tons of people that, and I just have to go my mom and dad. I mean, yeah. if it weren't for my upbringing, I don't think I would be the person I am. So I have to give a lot to them, but All of that, Emily, to say, yes, there are people that I pick up the phone and I call and I talk to maybe on a daily basis, but every football official that went before me, they were all male, but from the start of this, if it weren't for them holding everybody else on that field accountable and laying the foundation and just the integrity that every official that I've ever encountered in the NFL and across the country, but all of them are are mentors to me. Yeah. Yeah. It does. It takes, um, they've set the boundaries, right? And right. then you, you fall in those guardrails, but you make your own way too. I mean, I think I read a quote from uh, Gary, Gary, Austin, Gary Austin, excuse me, about your ability to both judge the rules in, in the context of the game, but also the context of the way that they were intended to be implemented. And I think that's a hard thing to do, to, to get in the way of people's passion when they are competing. Yeah. And then still make the call. So how do you handle the feedback that you get when the call doesn't go the way that they want? Sure. Um, there on the field, it's, it's pretty short-lived at times. I mean, some can carry on a little longer, but they're passionate about it. Right. But, you know, the, the spirit of the game, or if I miss something, I, I don't want to. I'm going to go back and critique. None of us want to. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, you've, you've got a speed limit of 65 miles an hour. If you're doing 66, 67, there's going to be some leniency there. Now, if you really start violating the law or the rule and you're doing 70, 75, then we're probably going to have a situation. So I think it's knowing the rule, but the spirit of the game and not getting yourself interjected into the players um, and, and what their passion is. We're there to manage and I want to say administer athletic justice. Oh, I love that. (laughs) <laughs> That's a powerful way to be. That's better than just referee and the rules or officiating. I heard, um, I, I heard my high school white hat used to say that. He used to I say, love that. don't let the rules get in the way of a good gang. We're just here to administer athletic justice. So, Oh, I love it. How much conversation is there on the field? How much feedback do you get real time? From peers or coaches or? or Both from the coaches yeah. and the players, I would say. Well, yeah. It appears course, you're working as a team. Yeah. I mean, we are. You know, right. Yeah. And, and we're, it's pretty immediate with us. It'd be like, Hey, I said, that's a good get Scott or uh, just, Hey, way to be there. Nice get a nice call. Hey, what do you think about that? You know, that feedback mm-hmm. amongst us as a team. Yes. 
from the players and the coaches, right. I mean, if they're, if they're passionate about something, they're going to express it. Um, but there's been situations where we've made some great calls on the field and the coach is going to say, Hey, it was a great job. So it's, yeah. it's a profession. Yeah. I mean, I think they have to respect the position that you hold given, you know, the merit of, of the way that you interact in the game has the ability to make or break the game too. So sure. I think that there's that sort of mutual respect and trust I would expect. Right. It is. I think about, um, you know, the people I serve are realtors and they are often also in the midst of managing highly emotionally charged interactions. You know, they're managing people who sure. are buying their homes or selling their homes. And they're the guys who are having to administer rules to some degree by telling them that they're either going to get the price they're going to get or not. And they yeah. let people down quite often. And it's the same kind of interaction in some ways. People don't want to hear what they don't want to hear, especially when they're emotionally charged around the subject. Yes. Yes, and I think definitely. that can be hard. Um, well, let me ask you this. As you are getting ready for a really special kind of NFL season, given the environment we're all in, what, how are you feeling going into the 2020 NFL season? I'm telling you, uh, 2020 has definitely thrown a lot of curveballs and a lot of challenges. And yeah. um, we are all approaching the season just like we would any other. Um, just the uncertainty, though, of what a crew may look like if one of us does test positive. But as far yeah. as our prep work, it's, it's been the same. Um, our rules, film study, now Zoom calls instead of like in-person meetings. But um, it's, it's, there's a lot of uncertainties, but we're, we're professionals and we're, we're gonna be prepared. Just like I said, the biggest thing is the ever evolving changing of things, whether it's daily, hourly, minute to minute. Um, but that's one great thing about officials. We're really good when there's change and we just adjust to it. I've tried to tell my kids, people that can adapt to change are more successful to me than people that just want to stay in the rut. Um, yeah. And I tell them, it's kind of like you can either have dial up or you can have high speed internet. You know, you get so, we got so accustomed to dial up. Of course, they don't even know what that is, but no, we got like, what are you talking about? <laughs> We got accustomed to dial up. And when you get comfortable with something, it's hard to go and, and experience that change. But yeah. we'll see how yeah. it's going to be. It's going to be a little different for sure. Will you have to use the electronic whistles in the same way that the college ball uh, officials are? We have them. I'm not real sure. Yeah. Uh, we, I feel like that would be hard. You've got muscle memory, you know, that yeah. you build into what you do physically. And then that's a completely different trigger, right? Yeah, it is. I, I've, I've, we've got the option, I believe. Uh, I've got it. Uh, I, I've got to test it out and see. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It would make me nervous to change the way I do things so dramatically. Oh, so I yeah. I could appreciate that. Uh, yeah. And then you'll travel just a ton. Yeah. I mean, officials are on the road so many weekends in a row, and that's going to look very different. Is there anxiety for you around that? No, um, not at all. We are going to try to do things more regional based, I believe. But um, if I can drive to the destination, I will. Uh, but if it's a hop, skip and a jump on a flight, of course I have children that I've got to be able to get home to and get them off to school sure. the next day. So, um, I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. We're going to be tested. So I'll take all the precautions and, and safety protocol that I'm supposed to, to keep myself safe as well as everybody else I'm around. Sure, sure. And what do your kids think about what you do? What, what do they say about it? <laughs> How old you are know, they? You know, I've got 19, 17, and 7. Okay. Uh, the two oldest are boys, and then I have the little girl. And the boys were so young, I was always gone. I mean, I was just gone during, on the weekends. Right. Um, and they knew, but I wasn't on TV as much. Uh, Bailey, right after she was born, I got hired into the NFL. And so she's seen me on TV and... I remember her saying, mom, you're the only girl. And I was like, yes. And she said, in the world, mom. And I went, oh. I haven't thought about it that way. Yeah. Um, my, but the boys are, now that they're friends, hey, your mom, you know, whether it's good or bad, hey, they're talking about your mom or that's your mom, dude. Yeah. Um, it's, it's fun for them. And, but then the little one, when Halloween, I looked at her and I said, what do you want to be for Halloween? We've got to go to party city. And she said, no, we don't mom. She said, I want to be you. I want to be an NFL official. So oh. <laughs> I got to dress her up. 
Yeah, it was great. That's fun. That's awesome. Yeah. The flat, the flag and all. Yeah, everything. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Um. And and do they all love football? Are they, they athletic in their own right? They are. So my oldest is playing baseball at Meridian Community College. Wow, that's awesome. Um, yeah, and then my junior, he's 6'4", and he's playing catcher at Northwest Rankin. And she hasn't started yet just because, you know, dragging her around to all of their events and, and me being yeah. where I am. And but she's starting to take interest in, hey, I want to play something, Mom. It's time. And I'm like, you're right. It is time. Yeah. I work full time and the breadwinner for my family. My husband stays at home, but what I recognize is that it takes a lot more than a mama to raise a family. And Absolutely. you've had a village of people that have helped support you through your time away. Is yes. that and it I think it's interesting um that you're both breaking the gender role of your role as an official in, in the NFL, obviously, but also in terms of how you mama and especially in the South. I mean, yes. you know, there's an expectation for how we raise our babies. Uh, That's and it, right. it's one that puts you there every weekend and you weren't, but I expect that your kids have a different kind of respect for you and yes. they see you differently than maybe some of their friends see their mamas. Absolutely. And I've told them, I commend all the, the parents. I shouldn't say moms that stay at home because you just made reference to your, your husband, my neighbor, he stays at home with three beautiful girls. Well, now two of them are in school, but um, his wife is a dentist. So yeah. the parents that stay at home, I truly commend them. Yeah, I could do too. it if I, I could do that if I had to, you know, but um, I, I, I don't have to. And so I'm very programmed to get up and go and do. And I've always been that way. Uh, my yeah. father said, but when people used to call, like to speak to me on the phone, he goes, who are you kidding? All she does is eat and sleep here. But I'm, I'm on the go constantly. <laughs> but I yeah. tell my kids, you, you've seen your mom go out and do. Um, and so if you do end up marrying someone that wants to stay at home, that's got to be a, a discussion that y'all have to have because you're going to have to respect her or she's going to have to respect you on that level. But mom's been gone so much, but I hope they don't hold it against me. No, I don't think they do. I mean, I, I know what yeah. my kids see in me. I think they see it obviously even more now that I'm at home doing this every single day. I have, right. I wonder what their, uh, how they'll reiterate what work looks like later. <laughs> uh, yeah. Zoom calls and, and talking to people on a screen all day. But I, I think that that shapes them differently and, and different is okay. You know, it is. I, 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 I agree. They're going to be well-rounded. Um, so how do you balance it all? Cause you're, I mean, you're making reference to how much you're gone and it's true. And even when you're home, you must be working so hard. And so what are you, what are you doing to take care of yourself? Well, you made reference to it takes a village to just rear children and, and good people. And so I, I definitely have that village. I have a lady that helps me here at the house. I've got um, my mom and dad, of course, with the COVID thing has been kind of shaky. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have some neighbors that are just like my adopted parents and my kids adoptive grandparents. They do so much for the kids to help me out. But it literally is treat others the way that you want to be treated and it, things come full circle. And so I, I pray that I've, I've helped enough people out and I'm going to continue. And I think that it's just now I'm able to lean on them. Also saying no. I mean, that's tough for people like me and you, but mm -hmm. um, I've learned when it's not a priority, I don't have to feel like I got to go to dinner with girlfriends or friends or whatever, yeah. or, you know, I, I, I just, Hey, no, I'm gonna stay home or I don't, I, I don't have to do certain things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think this time at home has kind of taught us that to some degree, we've sort of reset everybody's expectations about, we both miss it. You know, I, I miss obviously the social aspects of being out and about and with my friends and loved ones. But I think too, like everybody needed to go home for a minute. Yeah. And that was I okay. think it was, yeah. Push the pause button. Let's see but I'm ready to like hit play again. And, yeah, and, I you're think, like, I think, and now I'm ready to go. <laughs> and, and I think that that's happening. You know, it's crazy for every, for a long time. And then it's just like, bam, all right, we're, we're going to be getting ready. We're going to live do life things. again. Yeah. And you know, as well as I do with your children, how many do you have? I have two little boys, nine and five. I gotcha. Um, with, with my kids being gone, they just know when I say I, I'm wheels up at 6am in the morning to whenever I get back, there better not be any shenanigans. It better be. And yeah. it's just, I've, I've just laid the foundation, you know, the groundwork. Yeah. It's what they know. I mean, right. it's not, you know, for at this point, especially as long as you've been doing this now, I mean that you've level set that expectation with them. Right. 
which will teach them independence and their, the ability to, you know, be responsible and accountable and all those things, which is amazing. Those are gifts for them. Um, so tell me, how do you take care of yourself? I mean, it's a very physical job that you've got, right? Yeah. What, what are you doing to take care of yourself? How much do you have to train in, in your off season? What does that look like for you? Yeah, that, that training is all the time, but I probably, during the season, I may back off a little bit because I'm on the field on Sunday and then the travel, you know, Saturday or Friday night to Sunday or Monday. Um, So during the season, it's a little less as far as during the week, but during the off season, it's, I have a trainer, I'm able to go and do weights. I don't really pound the pavement anymore outside just because I'm getting a little older and um, I've played sports my whole life. So I want to be able to save my knees and my back. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. but I have a trainer and it's just literally just lifting weights, walk, treadmill, bike, elliptical. But typically it's just the trainer three days a week. And then the treadmill as often as I can get up there. Yeah. Which I would think is both good for you mentally and physically. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, as an athlete for a long time. Sure. Yes. I need sure. to start yoga. I hear it's great. You know, I, just you for know the... I've heard that too. <laughs> I have a mat. I do it occasionally, but yeah. I can't sit still quite long enough to breathe in and out like that. But I know yeah. it is good for you. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me leave you with this. I think that the return of football, especially as somebody in Texas who has grown up loving it, uh, is like a really healthy thing for us culturally right now. I think America needs the game for a minute. I think we need to feel kind of centered again in something that feels yeah. routine. And um, do you feel pressure around that to deliver an experience and deliver that game so that people no. feel like to normalcy? I don't. I, I think just what you're making reference to is everybody is just so excited. I mean, watching yeah. game day, even it was a condensed version this past Saturday was just like, I mean, I, I, I'm standing in the kitchen and I just gave out a big old scream after a story that they told and it's just yeah. uplifting and it's exciting. But no, I don't, I don't feel any different pressure this year compared to any other year, but I just sure. don't consider it pressure. It's just, I've got a job to do and I've got to do it well. And that's always yeah. been the mentality. Well, I know that you will bring many people joy this fall. Everybody's super excited. We'll be rooting you on. We're super excited to have you speak with our membership soon. And I just thank you for having this conversation with me. Absolutely, Emily. It's been my pleasure.